behind me. Um, you can tell that it's a new day because I'm wearing a different shirt. Uh, this is Professor Anderson continuing with the SPC course and looking at Conrad's Heart of Darkness. This is the third in the series of lessons that I'm posting. Um, in the end of our kind of class discussion over Zoom the other night, we were talking about the bucket guy, right, who comes out from nowhere when there's a fire with this little quart of a pail, dips it in the water, and tells Marlo that go, everything is going wonderfully as they're trying to put out the fire. But in fact, there's no way it can be going wonderfully when this person has already lost all his credibility, right? He's putting um, all of the his hopes in a bucket that has a hole in it and only has a quart of water. And in so no way is what he's doing actually going to put out the fire. Right? It's something that makes him feel better, but it's not something that actually accomplishes the task that needs to be accomplished. So one of the things that we know about Marlowe right away, our not narrator, but the, the person who's speaking for most of the text, right, is that um, Marlowe is kind of driven crazy and is really developing a sort of contempt for everybody who he's around. This is somebody who's always taken pride in his profession. He shares that at the very beginning. Um, and yet as part of this colonizing venture, he really feels lost and, and ill-suited for what's going on. Part of this contempt is derived from the sort of things that he overhears and from the fact that he's looking for somebody who has an idea, right? Something that redeems the, the process of colonization, and he hasn't yet been able to find it. So I directed you to pages 27 to 30, saying that those pages at the very beginning of part two of Heart of Darkness are among the most complicated in the text, simply because it's really hard to figure out who's talking. So there's a mechanical problem that makes it really difficult to figure out literally what's occurring, not only just what does it mean or what does it signify, but just the mechanics of it. And part of this is that most likely Conrad, who is no mean skills as a writer, right, like is actually trying to replicate the experience of overhearing a conversation when it's late at night and that sense of disorientation that comes. So on 27, right after the page break, right, we have one evening as I was lying flat on the deck of my steamboat, I heard voices approaching and there were the nephew and the uncle strolling along the bank. So the first thing you have to do is you have to remember the nephew is the manager and that the uncle is the person who's held, who's um, running the El Dorado exploring expedition which is a name that's just comically bad, right? Like, and I think it's really meant to be the El Dorado Exploring Expedition, the Triple E, you know, like it's just, it's a stupid name. And so in some ways, either Conrad or Marlowe's kind of poking fun at this from the very beginning. Okay, I laid my head on my arm again and had nearly lost myself in a doze when someone said in my ear, as it were, I am a harmless as a little child, but I don't like to be dictated to. Am I the manager or am I not? I was ordered to send him there. It's incredible. And because the person has said, am I the manager or not, you know that that person has to be the character we only know as the manager. So Marlowe says, I became aware that just two were standing on the shore alongside the forepart of the steamboat just below my head. I did not move. It did not occur to me move. I was sleepy. It is unpleasant, grunted the uncle. Okay, and so now all of a sudden we have the uncle talking. Then we have, they both agreed it was frightful and made several bizarre remarks. And these remarks, we have no idea who did, who said them until we get to when the uncle said, right? So here we have to remember, it's not the manager. It's the leader of the El Dorado expedition. The climate may do away with this difficulty for you. And then we have to put together that this difficulty is Kurtz. Is he alone there? Yes, answered the manager. He sent his assistant down the river with a note to me in these terms. Clear this poor devil out of the country. And the only way that I knew before when I was reading that that this problem was Kurtz is because the very last sentence of this paragraph is they had been talking about Kurtz. So really what Conrad did is he really threw us in there um, in a really deliberately probably um, disorienting sort of position that makes us sympathize with Marlowe right from the get-go. So um, as we keep going through it, one of, this is also one of the really valuable sets of passages because it's the first time that we kind of hear Marlowe. Okay, now this is about to get really awful. I keep talking about these framing devices on top of framing advices. This is one of the few places where we seem to get 
Kurtz's voice before we've actually met Kurtz. So on page 29, in part two toward the beginning, there's a quote that begins, each station should be like a beacon. Okay, and what this is, is um, the fat man, who we have to know is the manager, right, sighed, very sad, and the pestiferous absurdity of his talk continued the other, right? And this is the manager speaking, right? He bothered me enough when he was here. And then what the manager does is he mimics or makes fun of Kurtz by quoting Kurtz. Okay, so just to paraphrase before we get to this, what we're reading is um, dialogue paraphrasing Kurtz's dialogue from the manager who's being overheard by Marlowe, who has told a story to our narrator, which we're now reading. Okay, so this is dialogue within dialogue within dialogue within dialogue. But nonetheless, we have a quote from Kurtz that um, that said and reset over and over again by all these voices is intriguing in some way. Each station should be like a beacon on the road toward better things. Okay, and this is Marlowe, or this is, pardon me, the manager making fun of Kurtz, right? A center for trade, of course, but also for humanizing, improving, instructing. Conceive you, that ass! And he wants to be manager, no, it's... And here he got choked up by excessive indignation, and I lifted my head the least bit. Okay, but what this is, is it's a time in which somebody who has actually met Kurtz tells us a little bit about what Kurtz believes, paraphrasing him to that a little bit. Now, the trick is that through this whole talk, the comfort that the uncle gives the manager is, don't worry too much about Kurtz because everybody dies out here anyway. Which if you remember is particularly meaningful because that was the creepy thing that the physician said earlier when he was um, measuring the head of Marlowe much earlier on. When Marlowe was getting his head measured, right? Um, the physician kept saying, well, you know, I never see them when they return, which was an allusion to this um, really, uh, unscientific assumption at the time, which was that somehow or another white people were damaged when they were exposed to a really hot environment. This is, of course, like part of the really dangerous sort of thinking that actually is used to warrant colonization, kidnapping, enslavement, all sorts of things. Because in many cases, the colonizing group of people, if they were European, would say, well, these people can be driven in this climate and it doesn't affect them right? Or as Marlowe says, just because they have a different color skin or a flatter nose is the way he describes it. So this idea that somehow isn't it convenient that white people aren't fit for labor in these environments. Yeah, there's a little bit of that in there. Okay, so as we start moving through this text, what becomes really clear is that Marlowe has, again, absolute contempt for these people. And on page 30, remember when we were talking together, I alluded to the idea of him referring to the members of the El Dorado Exploring Expedition as less valuable animals, right? And this happens like at several points that he's very dismissive of them. Like if the donkeys have some value, because at least they're useful, the problem is that the El Dorado exposition isn't, right? He refers to them at another place as an infliction. Now, part of this is actually turns out to be very warranted suspicion. And if we go really far ahead to page 62, okay, um, and I'll give you the beginning of the quote so you can get a sense of it. I'm going to give you another passage from Marlowe that it's possible you might have overlooked the significance of it. Um, and this passage kind of works to sustain Marlowe's sense that his fellow Europeans who are located in Africa are not great people. So the passage begins, I pulled the string of the whistle. Okay, and Marlowe is going to describe his actions and then those actions of the people who he describes the pilgrims. Okay, first, the notion of the pilgrims. Okay. Pilgrims is usually a word that we use to describe people who are religiously motivated and who move geographically for the sake of either um, religious ritual or worship or even sometimes missionary work, right? And if you remember, Marlowe's aunt had been convinced that he was one of the workers with a capital W, right? This is where Marlowe starts mocking such ideas because the people who he's traveling with are not pilgrims. They are not religiously motivated at all. And so repeatedly calls them pilgrims sarcastically. 
Now, I've got to say, out of all of the things that I struggle to kind of teach students to recognize, the hardest one is sarcasm, especially when it's sarcasm from another century, um, because there's something about the way that we're often taught history that we assume everybody in the past was nicer and more polite, which how we have that compatible with what we know that people in the past did is mind boggling to me, um, but nonetheless, it's there. People in the past were sarcastic, and that's exactly what Marlowe, and hence Conrad, who wrote Marlowe's voice, is doing right now. When he calls these people pilgrims, what he's doing is he's saying that really they're the exact opposite of a pilgrim, that there's no honesty or reverence in their actions. And that comes through in this passage. I pulled the string of the whistle, and I did this because I saw the pilgrims on deck getting out their rifles with an air of anticipating a jolly lark. Okay, a lark is a bird. A lark is also an outing or a frivolous engagement. In other words, exactly the same sort of thing we're not allowed to do right now. We are allowed no larks whatsoever. Um, and what he's doing is Marlowe is setting the scene where he's describing the pilgrims, who are the exact opposite of pilgrims, as getting excited by something that would be frivolous and unimportant and super fun. At the sudden screech, there was a movement of abject terror through that initial wedged mass of bodies. The wedged mass of bodies are here, Africans lining the shore. Don't! Don't you frighten them away! cried someone on deck disconsolately. And I pulled the string time after time. They broke, they ran, they leapt, they crouched, they swerved, they dodged the flying terror of the sound. The they there is a description of the Africans on the shore. The three red chaps had fallen flat, face down on the shore, as though they had been shot dead. Only the barbarous and superb woman, more on that later, did not so much as flinch, and stretched tragically her bare arms after us over the somber and glittering river. And then that imbecile crowd, here are the pilgrims, down on the deck started their little fun, and I could see no more for the smoke. Okay, their little fun creates smoke, and because their little fun creates smoke, we know that what they're doing is shooting. Okay, so if what they were doing was shooting, why were they upset that Marlowe's pull of the whistle frightened the Africans away because they had looked forward to the idea of shooting them. For them, it was a lark. Okay, so these are not good people, right? Because <laughs> such shooting would be, among other things, inefficient and purposeless in addition to being immoral, right? And we know that Marlowe is more often concerned about issues of efficiency than he is of morality. Um, and this fails on every possible way. Okay, so if we have Marlowe on one end, who's this person who's not really a great moral thinker, but is a consistent thinker, right? And then on the other hand, we have the would-be pilgrims, who are the exact opposite of pilgrims and really don't care about Africans as people, colonization as being an efficient process. They just want to make money and get out of there. They just want the ivory however they can. Then you have Kurtz. And Kurtz is somebody we know from overhearing earlier conversations that he's a person with an idea. And if you remember back to like that page four quote, right? Marlowe has great respect for the idea of ideas, right? Something that is a principle that strongly motivates a person. Like the bookkeeper who had an idea about what civilization should look like in his starch pressed outfits, right? That notion of an idea seems to salvage just about anything for Marlowe. Okay, so Kurtz then has this strange death scene that's one of the great death scenes in literature in which he talks about the horror of the horror. So if we go just one more page to page 64, we get a, a really morose description of Marlowe watching Kurtz's face, right? Anything approaching the change that came over his features, I have never seen before and hope never to see again. Oh, I wasn't touched. I was fascinated. It was as though a veil had been rent, torn. I saw in that ivory face you know, white, but also ivory, because that's the commodity they're there for. I saw in that ivory face the expression of somber pride, of ruthless power, of craven terror, of an intense and hopeless despair. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation, and surrender during that supreme moment of complete knowledge? He cried in a whisper at some image, at some vision, and he cried out twice, a cry that was no more than a breath, Okay, so I encourage you to actually read this passage out loud to yourself and try and see how creepy you can make it sound because you can do pretty well with it. So part of it is I want you to go through and go to the discussion board now 
And I'd like you to post there a description of what you think is happening. And part of this involves, it involves two steps. One is you have to kind of process the idea of if these are last words, what are the, what's the significance of a person's last words? Like you need to process that. Um, and so I have like the last words game up there, which is optional. Um, and also a sense of asking you to really think through what last words mean and why we should therefore pay extra attention to this passage. Then the other thing that's up there is um, a description of what you think is the horror that Kurtz is evoking at that moment. In a novel in which there's no shortage of horrible things, do you think it's a specific horror that like there's something specific that Kurtz is thinking about? Or is it just the general world of colonization that's the horror? Um, or do you think it's something that is personal to him, right? Is there a personal horror he thinks he's committed or a personal shame that he has? In other words, is it that he's witnessed a horror or that he has done the horror? I think those are really kind of big sorts of questions. So in the discussion board, I'd like you to think through what could be meant by the horror. And I'd like you to find a quotation, if at all possible, at least an example, to explain what is the specific nature of the horror that you think Kurtz is going through at that moment. Um, and specifically, this has to be informed by your understanding of what happens at the process of death. And since obviously none of us have had the experience of actually dying, really what I'm asking you are what are the mythologies surrounding death that are here getting evoked and brought forward? And some of those are going to be very you know, different in different cultures. And I think it's actually interesting if we have that. It doesn't have to be that you have to imagine that you're English in 1899. Um, but for you, what are your expectations? What do you think the script is? for last words in the moments right before death. Okay, thanks, and I'll have a ne another lecture up soon.